there. Okay, yes, we are we are recording it, but uh, as you can see, uh, there aren't a lot of notes in this PowerPoint. It goes from discussion to closing prayer. Um, I, like I say, I, I tried several times to to sit down and and get into it, and prayer didn't didn't help, and you know I just couldn't keep my mind on it. Ashley was in the hospital; we were having to go over and feed her dog and seeing a dog dying of bone cancer is not a, a, a real fun uh, experience. And, uh, you know, she's okay. He's okay right now, except that he can't touch his foot to the floor uh, at all. Uh, so we had that. And then my car broke. And anyway, sob story. Okay, Skip, that's enough. But that's why we don't have any, I don't have any notes Today, So what I thought we would do, and this is kind of an experiment also, I suppose, is let's just maybe, uh, well, number one, we can talk about anything anybody wants to talk about. So before I make my suggestion, uh, any anything you all want to talk about? Anyone? Bueller? 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 Crickets? Yep. Okay. Um, uh, I've got I've got a list of stuff. All right, go for it. So it's kind of random. Um, the like things it. that we could we could talk about now, whether they're tremendous ideas and how we develop them, but uh, obviously I think I need some some uh, participation. Um, I heard a shocking statistic last night um, that I may, may tell you, uh, but it has, I'll, I'll back up and say, what do we think the kingdom of God is? It's a pretty big subject, but... What is it? Um, I'm not going to offer something right now. I'm just asking questions. I don't think there's any. I'm not trying to make a right or wrong wrong thing here. Just asking questions about what people think the kingdom of God is. When I think of the king, and let me insert something here that I forgot to mention a while ago. This is Sabbath number four. And uh, not that anybody cares, but I'm going to be gone next week. I'm I'm going down to uh, uh, Jacksonville to to speak at the Church God International down there, and Michael's going to uh, run a discussion. We're going to do kind of what we're doing today, although I'm going to kind of keep it targeted to Jeremiah, but we're going to have a discussion. Okay. So what uh, what I think of when I think of the kingdom of God, I I, I jump over humanity i suppose and i think of the human the, the the kingdom of god as that period of time you know eternally where all of us are um changed and and so on i've got some friends that think that we are living in the kingdom of god right now and I, I look around and and I say, you know, boy, I hope not. Uh, or I hope this isn't the way that it's going to be. So I don't know if that makes any sense or not. But I, you know, when I hear kingdom of God, I think of, you know, what what would you say? The final part? So, so you, you think of, uh, would this be partly accurate? You think of the millennium. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll or as part of as part you you think the kingdom of God encompassing the millennium plus other stuff. Yes, yes, you you hit the nail on the head. Uh, it's it's after the return of Christ. How's that? Okay, so those events and circumstances after the return of Christ. That's the way I. That's okay. Well, I just have a comment. When you say you have friends that 
say that we're living in the kingdom of God. I mean, uh, a kingdom is ruled by a king. So what they are saying is that they believe that Jesus is currently in charge of of what's going on on this planet. And the, I would turn it back onto them and say, so, so you think this is as good as he can do. He's the king of this kingdom. He's, according to you, he's here and he's in charge. And this is what we get. Yeah, I agree with so you. I, I, and I, and I would I, have to say, looking at what we have right now, how could how could you say that uh, that Jesus is ruling over and allowing what's I mean he's it's clearly being allowed, but it's not being allowed because Jesus is in charge and can't do anything about it. So that's all. Yeah, you're you're exactly right, and and I have told them that this is you know in the Bible study I go to on Wednesday mornings. Uh, the comment has been made many times that we're living in the kingdom of God. And I've, I've told them, you know, boys, I, I, I don't agree. And I certainly hope not. So I agree with you hundred percent, Jill. I'd like to answer that question. Uh, I think of the kingdom in three phases. First, when Christ returns and we're, some of us prayerfully will be spirit and there'll still be humans on the earth. And, uh, it will be the earth and we'll work on cleaning it up. And then after the uh, last great day, when um, so many come up in the kingdom that um, are still, still physical, and then after we're all physical, excuse me, all spiritual, when the new Jerusalem comes down to the earth, I think of that in three phases as being all the kingdom and actually the after we're all spiritual, I was talking to a friend uh, the other day, and uh, it occurs to me, we if we're spirit, uh, I, I don't see us walking around in, in physical-like bodies, and uh, I can understand, I think we'll recognize everybody, but exactly how, I don't know, because it's in the spirit realm, and how one spirit recognizes another. Uh, we know that they manifested in physical being, so that uh, the physical beings could could see them, but after we're all spirit, I'm I'm not sure. <laughs> Isn't there? Could I, ask, could I ask you a couple of questions, Vicky? Sure. Um, could you do those three three phases again for me? Okay. I think of the first phase as when Christ returns um, to keep this world from annihilating itself. Uh, and how it will be a very confusing time for everybody, but that those of us that um, are spirit beings that meet Christ in the air will be be here, and Christ will teach us, and we'll be all learning um, how to set things right, and I think it's it may take time, because there will be physical beings on the earth, and then I think of, of that as the first phase did you want to hear the other two yes please the um second phase i think of is after um the on the last great day when everyone that has ever lived will have a chance and they will come up physical and there'll be a lot of um instruction and and of learning and developing um how how things are going to work on this earth while we still have physical beings, uh, all the, the traffic, education, everything that we're dealing with now, uh, but will, it will be more perfect. Uh, and then after that, when we're all physical, all spiritual beings, I'm sorry, um, when the new Jerusalem comes down to this earth and um, the earth will burn to, for purity, and that we'll all be spiritual, and exactly how that'll be, I, it's mind-boggling, but it's interesting to think about. So, question to anybody, not 
this isn't directed at Vicky necessarily, uh, or it, it really is a question to all of us, and that is who is in the kingdom of God? Do you do you have our our only our only uh, so so we have a common we have kind of a common language our only resurrected spiritual uh, beings like us hopefully resurrected and as we would have commonly said change into spirit or be spirit are they in the kingdom of god yes or no uh well i think the answer is obvious i'm trying yes i think we'd all agree yes what about the people who aren't changed at the return of christ are they in the kingdom of god they're subjects in the kingdom of god i guess i guess i would say that i'm very thankful and praise Yahweh that uh, the kingdom of God is not from here. Um, but it is something as, as to expound on what, what Ma said uh, about, you know, she talked about three phases. And I would look on it as part of this. Thanks to you, Mark, that we would call it part of part of us would say it's a restoration of what Yahweh intended from the beginning uh, or a reclamation of what was basically robbed from him from the beginning. Uh, to establish the kingdom of God, because you, you are going to have a kingdom on this physical earth and you're going to have Christ as its king and you have a king, you have subjects, but they're all working towards a much greater resurrection towards the family of God, which culminates in the uh, city of God coming down uh, out of the, uh, you know, uh, the new Jerusalem coming down out of the third heaven. Uh, so I guess it, it could encompass all of that. Um, I think a lot of churchianity right now looks at the kingdom of God only as a spiritual entity that only exists in, in heaven and that it's not, or they believe that it's here on earth in our hearts. Um, I think those of us from our tradition uh, or our, our, our background look as it, it is a literal kingdom. There's enough scriptures to back that up. And so it, it's an amalgamation of both actually. Okay, so you you is this correct, Michael? That you would say people that are in or subject to a government formation of of the authority of God, they could be either those resurrected at, and meet Christ in the air and they're and changed, and those who are beings or people that aren't changed at that time they are are is it fair to say that they are in the kingdom of god yes because they are being they would be ruled by it well, yeah well they might not want to be ruled by it we know that the prophecies speak of for example egypt's not coming up to keep the peace of tabernacles in zechariah 14 and there's going to be punishment that is going to be uh, exacted upon them uh, the only way that happens is if you have an authority in power that can exert that kind of punishment to uh, to establish its justice over uh, rebellion or over criminality. And so in that with that definition, that would be part of phase one, as Ma put it, uh, then yes, that's still the kingdom of God uh, because they're going to be enacting the father's justice on a rebellious people. That's my understanding. Okay, so but you have you have sort of phases. You have people who are changed at Christ's coming, but you have people who aren't changed and are some of them are rebellious. Correct? And and then speak out if I'm I'm just trying to summarize well, I guess let's I guess the term that I key in on to make my my for my thought process is being subject to 
you have subjects in a kingdom. Okay, yeah. And you could say that those of us that are flesh right now are subject to the spiritual kingdom of Yahweh Elohim in the third heaven because we subject ourselves to his laws and his ways. We call ourselves his people, his subjects. Now, the rest of the world, you know, the vast majority, it do doesn't because they worship other other Elohim, okay. other, other gods. Uh, we don't. We're 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 making a willful decision to claim Ye uh, Yeshua the Christ as our king and his father as, as our great Lord, as our God. And we are his people. So we we subject ourselves to uh, his laws and his ways. The Western world doesn't, but we know there's a time coming when Yeshua returns that the world will be forced into, into subjugation because Yahweh Elohim will be reclaiming that which was his to begin with. Does that make sense? Does that explain it better? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, no, I'm not saying you didn't explain it. I'm just trying to trying to reword it not in a better way. I'm not trying that at all. I'm just I'm rewording things so that I've got something to hang on from your words so yeah jim this is definitely in the kingdom of god category but a little off the wall would you say that during the period of samuel that that was the kingdom of god Because God was the ruler up until they asked, you know, well, for a king. Okay, okay. Specifically, I mean, not as we normally think of it, but right. You know, in a so, sense, it was. But we have, we, are, yeah, you're right. I mean, God, Samuel looked to to God. God said, you know, you the people have rejected me, and they wanted a king. But if we go back earlier in the book of Judges, we find that the angel of the angel of the Lord, the angel of Yahweh, met with all the tribes, and he said to them, "You guys haven't obeyed me since you came out of Egypt, and you won't do. I brought you. This is obviously my paraphrase. I'm not quoting, but." I brought you into this land, the promised land. You haven't followed me. I'm out of here. Now you can find that in the book of, uh, it's either in Joshua or Judges. I could find it. But I guess the, the point is, is that, yeah, God was in Samuel's time. Yes, Yahweh was involved, but kind of and kind of not. I mean, he'd already told everybody he's leaving because they rebelled against him back in back in the time of the judges, the earlier judges. Samuel was a judge, by the way. Okay, so what we have is kind of a yes and no kind of situation. That's the way I view it, Jim. Could, that makes sense? Couldn't we... <clears throat> Couldn't we uh, look at uh, Solomon's kingdom as as, as, as somewhat uh, messianic? There was silver on the streets, uh, you know, I, prosperity and everything. That's a good point, Rod, because oftentimes the reign of Solomon has been seen as a type of the kingdom of God. But obviously not everything was good, <laughs> was, was good. Yeah, uh, you, those are good points. I mean, there's there's hints all through the scripture. Um, uh, but if we go, take that idea of Solomon and go to the return of, of Christ. You know, he returns, yet he has to make war. And then we have the period of that we think, you know, that we see a thousand year reign of, of Christ and, and his saints reigning with him. But we've already said there was going to be rebellion 
during that time because Egypt won't come up. It, well, we're not told Egypt won't come up. The example is if Egypt won't come up, they will have no rain on them. And then the most perplexing thing happens at the end of this time as we have interpreted it. And we have the devil being released and he immediately goes out and is able to, to, dece to deceive the nations. And they come up against Jerusalem again and make war. And this is after the millennial time when God's been reigning for, Jesus has been reigning for a thousand years. And uh, Vicki brought up the third point, so I'm kind of rambling but throwing stuff out. Uh, Vicki brought up the third point about the new heavens and new Jerusalem. New heavens, sorry, new heavens and new earth and Jerusalem coming down, and the gates of the city. You know, well, if you remember in Revelation, there were gates of the city, and all the nations of the earth would have access to it. So how do you have nations if, you, if everybody is in the spirit? I, so I'm not proposing that I have answers for, for all of this. I'm just saying I think it's more complicated. And I don't know if there's a timeline that can be identified. But I'd like to go back to Michael, who said it's a kind of a... Pro Again, my words, not a quote, Michael. That there is a time when God... There are times God has to... Uh, subject, but there's also times when, like you said, when we when we subject ourselves to God and acknowledge Him as King. So, yeah, it is, well, is it Kingdom of God just some line in the sand? After all, Jesus said, "The Kingdom of God is among you." And he said that to the disciples. He also said the kingdom of God is within you. And our tradition has a hard and fast line drawn in the sand about when the kingdoms when the kingdom starts. And I I propose to you that there is a already but not yet aspect of what's going on yeah i'd like to take that uh what you have said mark uh because i can remember in the scripture it says the kingdom kingdom of god is at hand so i'm i'd like to tie that in with the term born again you know we are we are born again we are being born again and we will be born again. And I think that that ties in with the kingdom of God. Seems like they all have some kind of connection, huh? Well, I, I guess so. to go ahead, Bob. I, I guess to expand on your paraphrasing my point, Mark, I think it all boils down to the consent of the governed. That's a phrase that's kind of unique to the United States, but it's actually biblical. You know, we, we consent to our being governed by the set of laws and rules of of the ruling power, the kingdom that rules us. And so in that regard, like I said, if we subject ourselves through baptism to the law of God through Christ, then we are subjects and heirs of, of, of the kingdom, as it were. Um, and I, I hear what your point is, is that our, our former church culture drew a line and said that the kingdom of God has to be literal only uh, because they were stark rejection to, you know, churchianity's definition that kingdom of God exists in your hearts. And I think we're coming to a reality that it actually exists in both because if we're subject, subjecting ourselves to being consent to be governed by the laws of God, then that makes us subjects of the kingdom. Does it not? I 
that's 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 decent reasoning to me. I think. I I have a tendency to to agree, basically, with what Vicky said. Only I would, um, based on what you and, and Michael have said, Mark and Barb, I would I would back that up and and say maybe those of us who have God's Holy Spirit dwelling in us, and I don't you don't care what church they go to, whoever it is, that that we are in in the kingdom in that we are subjects like what Michael said we're subject to God more so than people who don't have God's Holy Spirit. So so maybe uh, those of us living today that have God's Holy Spirit are in, in, in the kingdom of God, or at least at the beginnings of the kingdom of God. Uh, can we go back <clears throat> even before mankind? Um you know, with God and all of the angels, the third of whom rebelled, was that not the kingdom of God? It's certainly a kingdom of God. Well, wouldn't it make sense that whatever God rules is his, is his yeah. kingdom? Yeah, so I, I kind of think, in a sense, the kingdom of God has existed from the time that God made beings. you know, uh, angelic or human. Yeah, I mean, uh -huh. what do we believe? That God is in charge. He is ruler. He is supreme. Uh, I think Rod had a comment. I, I remember Garner Ted Armstrong used to say that the kingdom of God is like other kingdoms. It has a territory. It has laws. It has... Uh, Subjects. Subjects, yeah. And, and uh, I don't know, I just sort of liked his uh, approach to it. Which I still remember, so. But, in, okay, in a state of rebellion, when you have it, go back to the angels, as, as Jim pointed out, does the kingdom of God still not exist, even though there's rebellion? That would be, that would be the you know, one way to look at it. And again, I think it all boils down to the willing consent of being governed by that, which rules you. And if you're going to, you know, uh, rebel against it, there, there's obviously going to be punishment for the rebellion in order to prevent abject anarchy. Uh, because Yahweh is, is, is sovereign. I mean, a government has to be sovereign, but we know that there's a plan being worked out, a blueprint, a purpose, but ultimately, again, it boils down to the fact that yeah, our Father wants us to seek Him. He wants us to subject ourselves to Him, uh, and 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 that's a willing uh, decision that we each have that we we need to make in order to be considered citizens of the kingdom of God. Go ahead, Joel. I'm sorry. That's okay. I was just going to just been thinking this through that at the time of creation or or at least the story we have of the garden of eden um evil was was already present as part of that creation or very soon thereafter however it appears because um if jesus was slain from the foundation of the world the reason he was slain was to conquer evil so evil was present and and it makes sense that evil was present in the garden of eden otherwise why would there have been the tree of life which was something they had a choice to take um and and so when they chose evil then they were denied the the tree of life but that tells me that that the Garden of Eden was the beginning of a process that involved the development of a relationship with God by humanity and the choosing uh, of good and God's way over evil <clears throat> with a tree 
in the garden that presumably had things gone differently, then that tree would have been offered to them or they would have been able to choose to take that. Um, and, and so when you move forward, when um, to the end time, we've gone through Christ's uh, life and death and resurrection and evil has been defeated. So the implication is that in the kingdom to come, evil will, will not be present um, ulti at, at the ultimate end of it, because otherwise Christ's sacrifice was in vain if evil is not destroyed. Um, so there have to be the two things are are different, but um, it's it's kind of like the same procedure. You have to it's like raising children. You you teach them and instruct them as the parents, and it appears, you know, kind of when you read in Isaiah thirty, and it's talking about the people in Zion living in the New Jerusalem, and and how the, you you'll hear the voice of your teachers, you know. Um, saying this is the way walk you in it and so I kind of look at uh, the the coming kingdom as a time when there will be as Vicky said a mix of um, of people I mean if you are if if those of us who are faithful to God are changed at the time into something different then that means we're not the same as what we are now. So I would question anybody saying that the kingdom of God is living in you now. I mean, I understand the the uh, the, the message behind that, but um, some it's not complete because otherwise you wouldn't need to be changed at the end end time. Um, well, that, that was part of my point. Is that there? There is an uh, already but not yet feature, because you have clear, I think, clear uh, indications of people following God with a good and right heart. That doesn't mean that they are that they are as we always say, doesn't mean they're perfect. But part of what we see in all of this is loyalty to God. You know, as God, as the Supreme. Not that they're perfect. That's That's my view. I mean, I don't see how um how God how Jesus could say the kingdom of God is among you or the kingdom of God is within you if he didn't in some way mean that. Um, that, that doesn't mean you're eternal, but I think Mike Michael had a great explanation that you are subjecting yourself, you're choosing something and you're becoming loyal to the ruler. Yeah, Jill, Jill was using a familial construct to try to illustrate her point. Um, I'm going to create a crude, this is a very crude allegory or analogy, but it's one that I, I suppose maybe this would go towards helping us kind of come to grips and understand a little bit in a very crude fashion what it is that, you know, these phases of the establishment of the kingdom of God what it is let's look at the history of our own country from when it began small the pilgrims on the mayflower they had a set of principles they had a set of ideas that were uh you know adherent and obedient to the law of god and they came here for the sole purpose you can read this in bradford's diaries to uh establish a religious christian community that was not beholden to king or pope that but could be led directly by the spirit of, of, of God. 
Uh, and so what they they ended up what ended up happening is you had the foundational ideas, the principles that ended up becoming a nucleus that by the time you got to the mid 1700s uh, had developed a quasi nation uh, of people. Now, not everybody, uh, you know, subjected themselves to everything that uh, that the Quakers or that the Pilgrims or the Puritans uh, wanted to do. But by and large, the general principles that they believed in was enough to forge a nation to the point that when uh, Great Britain decided that they wanted to uh, put an end to that and subject the colonies to their uh, ultimate authority, they rebelled for the purpose of establishing a, 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 a solid nation. Now, we know from our own history that as we began to expand westward, there were Indian tribes and Indian nations that wanted no part of the ideas, the principles that uh, that the colonizers were governed by. So they set up, you know, small communities, small towns. And if you look at the way the country grew, uh, manifest destiny, as it were, um, and eventually you even had Indian tribes that were realizing that the principles and the ideas worked. Uh, they could help actually forge a people, forge a nation. They have a single idea founded on a set of laws and principles that ultimately were rooted in the law of God. Um, now we're obviously in our society now is in a state of abject rebellion, but I'm just using it as an allegory to perhaps the way that Yahweh is bringing about the kingdom of God in phases, the way Ma said, Ma meaning Vicky. Uh, it has to be done, you know, in increments up until you get to the point, like Jill said, where every enemy of the king has to be put down. They all have to be subject to him. The last enemy to be destroyed itself is death. Is thrown in the lake of fire where all other evil is thrown and destroyed. And at that point, then we are homogenous and one with the, the, the spiritual kingdom. And of course, the father comes down out of the third heaven. Does that help at all as far as an allegory kind of, you know, because the scripture is filled with, you know, physical allegories to help us understand spiritual truths. And, you know, Yeshua used agricultural allegories all the time. I'm using a a bad one in terms of our own country, but we are unique outside of ancient Israel that, uh, you know, that kind of explains a little bit of what I'm thinking. Am I also, off? I, I'd like just to, to put in here, it's not, it sort of dovetails, but it, it's not exactly the same, but we have to remember that the Bible says that Satan is the God of this world and uh, of this earth. And um, until he is put down and, Christ returns. I, I don't think. I don't think we can say we're in the kingdom now. Well, that's interesting because that gets to Mark's initial point: is could, could the kingdom of God exist uh, when it's not fully established yet? And as was mentioned, even when you get to the end of the Book of Revelation, there's going to be a massive rebellion after the millennial rule of Jesus Christ. Are we then going to say that? The kingdom of God, it wasn't here then yet. I guess my thought process is that the kingdom of God is that which we subject ourselves to. Those of us that subjected ourselves to God's laws and ways through baptism and have the Holy Spirit are already subjects to that kingdom is where my thinking is. But the actual literal establishment of, of Yahweh's entire plan isn't going to be fulfilled until we get to the end of what Ma said was phase three, which is what I concur with. Yes, I mean, that brings up an interesting point because it, the scripture is quite clear that it does say, you know, there's plenty of references to the kingdom of God is among you and, and you know, and that, um, and there, so there is an aspect, uh, you know, uh, the, the, uh, the phrase kingdom of God must be multifaceted in that if you, like you said, if you have a heart to be subject to God, and choose him as your king, then you are a subject already of the kingdom of God in the, in the same, in that when the king returns to rule, you have already pledged your allegiance to that kingdom. So from, you know, so it, it's the kingdom itself in, in all its glory is not 
here yet because evil still is present and at the like you said at the end death and evil evil to me death represents evil that that is the last thing to be destroyed um but if you're going to establish a new a new kingdom it's it makes sense that you would gather subjects and and a spiritual army to and the scripture seems to bear this out that that to be the kings and the priests and the leaders to help um you know run the kingdom and be the servants of the king and his emissaries and whatever to make it come to pass so the concept of the kingdom being among you now and in your heart it has more to, you know has everything to do with your your personal spiritual allegiance to the coming king um so so yeah it's not like a, a single point in time at which it switches over from um what we have now to to the kingdom it has to be i mean god is a god of order and he, even when he set up the garden of eden it, he said it was good he didn't say it was perfect he put men there to do the job as his servants that he wanted to bring about the kingdom of God, maybe at that time, and they chose not to be allegiant, uh, uh, allied to him, um, and chose evil instead. Um, and and we can look forward to a time when evil will not be a, a viable choice. It's ultimately, and the kingdom will come in its in all its fullness in the way it was intended. So yeah, yeah. I think Joe. Jill... I was Go sorry, ahead. talking yeah. at the same time. Sorry. So, Jill, you're talking about a process, and that made me think about the allegory that I gave. You know, we when the United States came into existence, we didn't just pop into existence like we are right now, back in the you know uh, seventh the middle 1700s. It was a process, and then you look at all the people around the world that saw that. Look, there's opportunity there in, 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 in the new world, in the United States. There's opportunity that we could be free from uh, kings and popes. Uh, we can make our own way. I'm not subject to class. I'm not subject to uh, nobles and serfs. I can make my own way and not be consigned to uh, the uh, the sins of my, my fathers or my ancestry. And so people began to come here. We began to emigrate here because people wanted to subject themselves to the American ideal. And I like that allegory because we have scriptures that tell us that even when Christ returns, the people of the nations, because they let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, and he's going to teach us his ways. He's going to teach us, you know, uh, his laws. And so there, there's, there has to be that willingness to subject yourself to the laws of God. And it's a process to the uh, the ultimate establishment, which comes at the end of phase three. Sorry, go ahead, Mark. Sorry. I was going to say that, you know, another point that that ties into what Jill was saying is that uh, as people become aware, isn't isn't baptism that acknowledgement, submission, and public proclamation that you are loyal to to God and submit to His rule in your life? It doesn't mean you're perfect. Who is, you know, but isn't that what baptism is all about? The death and burial of your old man and the resurrection of the new man. What does that mean? The resurrection, that's what Romans 6 likens it to, is Christ's death and his resurrection. You are, you are buried as an old man man and raised in in just as christ was raised it doesn't it say in newness of life and that the baptism is a public proclamation that that's what you stand for so it's like choosing sides and yeah, uh, choosing citizenship yeah. When you come to this country, you want to become a citizen, you learn the laws, and you take the oath. 
as it were. So I, I think it's a good analogy. That's what baptism is. For, you know? yeah, go ahead. for years, decades, I was convinced that the kingdom of God was like a curtain being drawn back. It was instituted or it came, it was instituted by Christ at his return and boom, that was it. That was it. So that apparently is a visible event. But let's, let's read what Luke 16 says. Skip, are you still there? Yeah. Can you get to that verse? Uh -huh. He's just got to zip out a PowerPoint full screen and go to his browser. Or Luke 16, what? 16, 16. Uh, any particular version? Doesn't matter. Okay, this is NASB. Let me enlarge it. Wait, wait, wait. Let me let me do this. Let me do this because we're gonna. This won't be the last time. Uh, let's see. Here, here's where I just have a couple of things on here. <laughs> a couple of things. Wow. <laughs> can, can you make it bigger? Yes. <clears throat> NASB. And now let me let me remember how to make it bigger. Uh, well, I can do it. I can do it. I can do it this way. Man, plus. 16, 16. Yeah, now, plus we'll do it. One. Try control plus. There we go. Okay. All right. So 16, 16. The law and the prophets were until John. Wait a minute. What? You're I in know. Exodus. You're in Exodus. It didn't change. I just wanted to see if you'd catch it, Mark. Yeah. The law and prophets were proclaimed until John. Since that time, the gospel of the kingdom of God has been preached, and everyone is forcing his way into it. But it is, uh, let's see. It is easier for a heaven and earth to pass away than for one stroke of the letter uh, of, of the letter of the law to fail. Wait, what did? Uh, oh, skip to uh, verse twenty. <clears throat> verse twenty. Luke. Oh, uh, Luke seventeen. Luke, sorry, I I messed that up. Luke seventeen. Verse twenty. Verse twenty. Having been questioned by the Pharisees as to when the kingdom was coming, that's that return of Christ. We would we would term it this way, as to when the kingdom of God was coming, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed. Nor will they say, Look, here it is, or there it is. For behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. And I put forth to all of us that that's us. Now, are, are we immortal? No, that's the point that Michael was making. This is a, this is a, for lack of a better term, sorry, a progressive thing. You know, we submit ourselves to God. We dedicate ourselves to God and make a public proclamation in baptism. And then we are seeds that God uses to grow and to influence others. And time will pass. Things will come to pass. Jesus says he will return. And it's a greater phase, greater phase, like Vicky said. But the point is, is it's not like, a, in my view, it doesn't seem to be a curtain opening and boom, Jesus returns and now we're in the kingdom of God. 
I suggest we have responsibilities as dedicated, committed people, a people for God who made a public proclamation that we are part of that. And whatever, you know, God gives us to do, we have to do. And it's an already but not yet circumstance. It's not yet what's going to be done. But it is already in that God is king. He is king. Alt, uh, the, the most high, the king, he has always been the head of his kingdom. And we are his subjects. And therefore, we are representatives of that kingdom. Paul even says we are ambassadors. Well, um, I like the already, but not yet. I, I, I heard that, you know, quite some time ago and used it in a sermon or Bible study or something. And, but I've never looked at uh, this verse 21 quite the way that um, the King James has it. But in this case, you can see where I clicked on the one. The king, and we can argue all day long about whether the disciples had the Holy Spirit at this point, but he says the kingdom of God is within you. Well, what does within you mean? I've always thought, well, that means that Jesus Christ was, no, I think based on what I'm hearing from you all, I, I think I'm convinced that he's talking about the kingdom of God is inside of us who have as you said, chosen sides. And we've chosen to obey God. And, and we know we have the Holy Spirit uh, dwelling in us. So the kingdom of God is within us. I, I think that makes plenty of sense. That's just me. Well, uh, go, hey, Vicki, Ma, go ahead. I, I sort of thought... Um, Christ doesn't become king until the Father sends him to rule over the earth. When does the coronation happen? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> it was a big question. We had a discussion in Paducah. Maybe we'll talk about that next week. I don't, and well, it has to do probably with, with, with the wave sheaf and the 10 days between the ascension of Christ and uh, Pentecost. We could talk about that maybe more next week. Uh, but my own so tie, tying into that is also that picture in Daniel 7 about the Son of God coming to Yahweh, the Son of Man coming to Yahweh at, at his throne. I, I thought of something a minute ago, and I don't know if it, if this little, I don't, it's not really an analogy, but anyway, this, I don't know if this really works or not, but when Saul was the king, he had been anointed and he was the king of all of Israel. Well, a little bit later on, David was anointed king. And he had a group of people that followed him. And I, I wonder if 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 that's maybe a type of what we're of, of what we're talking about. Uh, right now, Satan is the quote God of this world, if that's the way you want to look at it. But there's a small group that's not part of that kingdom, but it's part of another kingdom. And I don't know if that's a type of of what we're talking about or if that's the dumbest thing you all ever heard. We'll not vote. Interesting. Barb, you had you a comment. Do you want to? Yeah. Um, Mark mentioned uh, baptism. And say a man being baptized, he might say to himself, well, I'm saved. I'm born again. But, you know, worldwide didn't really recognize it in that way, but yet he was born again, but not 
foliage. He he is just dark. And then then there's the uh, process during his life as he's being born again. And like I mentioned, he will be born again in in fullness toward the end. You know, I mean when when Christ takes over. Uh, well, that's I, I I can't separate the born again from the kingdom of God. It, it's it's the same process. Well, think of the phrase that Marx used three or four times. We are born again already, but not yet. Yeah, I think Barb has a has a great way of saying that and in, in tying that together. I think that's meaningful. Well, I think we can go back also to, to what Skip said, because I didn't think that was foolish at all, because there, there are numerous um, examples throughout the scripture. Um, like you mentioned, you know, David was anointed while Saul was still ruling, but he but there was a window of time that had to expire before David was anointed, you know, was inaugurated as the king. And probably, like you said, in, during that time, he amassed his supporters uh, um, so that when he did take over, he had a group of people that he could trust and rely on. And, uh, you know, sometimes we think about... Um, like when Queen Elizabeth died, Charles was just right there and it was and he was inaugurated almost immediately uh, and coronated after that. But Mark and I were watching something on the history of of the British uh, monarchy back in the uh, whenever at twelve or thirteen hundred, so whenever it was, um, when there were enormous battles that went on within those staking claim to the uh, to the throne, and where uh, heirs that were too young to be um, to be placed in the role of the king were hidden away and protected because there were others who would kill them. And in many instances, they did get get hold of the young heirs and kill them so that they would destroy that line of um, of the monarchy and that they could, you know, be the next one in line by marriage or, you know, second cousin or whoever it was and in, and inherit the, the title. Um, and because even, what was it, Josiah that was hidden away? There was one of the... Um, where they killed every one of the king's sons, but the nanny hid one of them. Um, so there was an heir that was only a child. At, that was, uh, that was at, during Queen Althalia's reign, I think. Okay. I think, did she try to slaughter all the remnants of David, Athalia? There was, I know there was an instance and, and the nanny hid the, the one. So there was an heir, uh, protected and and in the wings waiting um that later took the took the throne um so i, I think i, I don't think that was i don't think that was josiah but uh it was it was wh whichever king it was yeah that... it wasn't josiah it was but it was another one when they went in and to like michael said to kill the entire family they wanted to lay waste uh, to to that line of king of of kingship within Israel. That was that was Queen Athalia, if I remember correctly, and I think that line needed to be preserved because the line of the tribe of Judah had to come from the line of David. So it was correct, necessary. and then you right, right. right. and you needed that to to uh, be perpetuated in order for Christ to be of their line of David. So um, I think you know there's just examples there that that the uh, the heir to the kingdom does not have to necessarily immediately take the throne upon being eligible. Um, lots of times there's lots of evil that plays out uh, before the true and rightful king um, takes the throne. Um, 
so uh, you know i think we shouldn't it, it's an encouragement for us not to despair that that you know christ has established himself as the the heir to the throne of god in the kingdom and um there's there's just a process that has to go along between that point in time and and his inauguration well, and it, if we that, are part of the army that's being assembled then we should accept that and uh, that role i yeah. i think the term we're looking for jill based on what you're talking about is is it called and i'm not too familiar with british uh uh royalty is it called investiture where uh they there's a there's a ceremony that's kind of an anointing uh, of the future king, it wasn't wasn't King Charles or isn't wasn't Charles had an investiture to make him Prince of Wales or something like that back in the sixties or something like that, where he was acknowledged that he's the future king, but his time is not yet type of a thing. I'm asking because I don't know. Well, the investiture is the the official formal ceremony um, of, of giving somebody a title or an office or a position. Um, I don't know for sure how it differs from a coronation, except that a coronation is always refers to a king, whereas an investiture can be uh, other titles that are lesser. Um, than than the monarch than the king or queen. Okay, so it's yeah, not I like it's not like Saul and, and David. I, again, I'm looking at the British Crown in particular. That that I just remember the term investiture. I wasn't sure if that again. I, I'm looking at at what you're saying, Jill, in terms of Jesus Christ, in terms of from his appearance before the Father as the way chief, up until the time he returns as king. See, the thing that I do understand from Scripture is that when he comes back, he is king of kings at that point. He's not coming back as a prince. He's coming back as king of kings, as the Lord of, the Lord, Lord of lords, uh, is, is my understanding. So I guess my thought was that term investiture, whether or not that applied, or could we look at Christ uh, after his crucifixion and, uh, you know, and before his, his second coming as an investiture of sorts? Not sure that that's that 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 would be the accurate word to use. I'm not positive of that. Um, but you know, you can be uh, if somebody illegal has taken the throne, or somebody well, not illegal, but um, it is it would have been possible for somebody to take the throne in England, and then. At a later time, they discover that somebody um, is more more closely that they're, they're more eligible. You know, they find an heir um, that maybe was not previously known about due to a marriage or whatever it was, and and they are um, senior in their right to claim the throne. Um, like King so Ralph with John Goodman. Which one? King Ralph with John Goodman. Oh, okay. kind of a Hollywood, a Hollywood version of what you're talking about. Was a but, play. you know, I mean, the the thing with Saul and and uh, David was clearly that you know God, well, God allowed them to uh, anoint. Well, it said God anointed Saul. He allowed him to be king, but at some point he removed that. Um, he removed his endorsement anyway uh, of Saul's kingship and and reassigned it to David. So God, you know, God rejected Saul because Saul wasn't loyal to him and didn't didn't follow what he was told to do. He went his own way. So yeah, you're right on that. So, you know, for, for years, like I said earlier, I saw this curtain, you know, I saw this definite, no, no kingdom, no kingdom, no kingdom, no kingdom, kingdom. 
and there's to me there is there is more to the story there there is as paul harvey would you'd say the rest of the story is part of the behind uh, behind our traditional thing that we have you know that 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 we were uh, a lot of us not everybody uh were were taught for years i found an interesting scripture that's kind of kind of has uh the two sides of this in a certain way in second corinthians 4 skip you still there yep second corinthians 4 um in verse 3 even if our gospel is veiled it is veiled to those who are perishing in their case the god of this world has blinded the eyes of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of christ well what is the gospel the gospel that word is just means the good news the good news of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So that to me, this is saying that relating to what Michael's talking about, about the placing of Jesus as the king, the good news of the glory of the of, of the anointed one, Christ, who is the image of of God. This all ties together to me to show Jesus at the right hand of God. You know, remember Stephen saw into heaven right before he died, Yahweh and Jesus at his right hand. It was infuriating, but he obviously was right there with the king, right there with the with Yahweh, the, you know, the ultimate. Amen. But in this case, in verse four here in second Corinthians four, the God of this world, we always said, well, if the God of the world is, is here, then we can't, we can't really have any aspect of the kingdom of God. I, you know, it doesn't seem reasonable to me that we've got just a, you know, a hard, no kingdom of God. Yes, there's kingdom of God. Now, verse five, for what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. That's what we're proclaiming, that he is king with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give light, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So that's part of our job to me is to be, what do we want to call them? Representatives, ambassadors, uh, the people called out of darkness to represent the kingdom of God in our lives because it rules us the kingdom if we say god rules us and god rules the kingdom what you know do those things not fit together we are subjects of the kingdom of god now completely i mean if this is the already and not yet thing right you don't have the ultimate manifestation of that, but we have a very important part now to play. Well, until this discussion today, I've been uh, no kingdom, no kingdom, no kingdom, kingdom person. I've, I've, I, I guess I've never really looked at it uh, past what I learned when I was in the Worldwide Church of God, but I, I think now based on what we've talked about that those of us who have god's holy spirit are quote in the kingdom now but already but not yet 
yeah, I think the confusion comes from that worldwide taught us that uh, the kingdom of God has to be a literal earthbound kingdom of a, a government that rules uh, with a rod of iron. And otherwise, it's not a kingdom. And yet they would always say, and I think that's basically because they were pushing against the uh, the doctrine in churchianity that the kingdom of God is in your hearts and it's already here. So worldwide was pushing back on that doctrinal belief and saying, no, the kingdom of God's not going to get here until Jesus returns. But then in the process of doing that, they're ignoring the fact. They would say that we're ambassadors for the kingdom of God, representing a faraway kingdom that's yet to come. Uh, but that negates the fact that a couple of things that that we're not already subject to that kingdom of God, you know, through baptism. You know, I mean, I, I would imagine if we are devoted to the principles of of righteousness, of true justice, of life, the words of life, that's what we want to subject ourselves to. Um, I would say using the allegory I gave earlier about the United States, that there are probably better Americans in India, for example, who are already devoted to the principles that most of us have discarded, that they, they want liberty, they want freedom, they want to subject themselves to true justice, uh, but they're they're stuck over there. And they would love to come here and subject themselves to uh, you know what we once were so that they can live a prosperous life. I think using that allegory, that's how we would look at the kingdom of God, that we recognize that our Father in heaven and his Son our king represent true justice, true righteousness, and they represent life. We want that life. We want part to be part of that. And so we subject ourselves to that through baptism, even though it's not here yet. We are already in spirit. Uh, in principle, uh, we are subjects to you know the Most High and his kingdom and his way, even though it, it's not established in the physical yet. At least that, that's my thought process. Yeah, Joel. Well, yeah, I mean, I would totally agree that when you look at everything in this world, um, it, it's a process, whether it's growing something in the garden, you plant a little tree, you know, you don't, you don't just get, you don't stick a bean seed in and, and next thing, the next day you're out there picking beans off your plant. And, you know, when you have children, you're your goal for a child is to raise that child to be an, a, a capable adult that can take their place and their role in, in society. And it's a process. Everything in this life is a process. You, it, to, to have it any other way is almost like to have a magician, you know, where you click your fingers and, and instantly the thing appears. And everything we look at that God has created denies that he does he just doesn't work that way now you know when it says in an instant we'll all be changed it it um it's still uh, you've got to get you've got to go through the process to get to the point where that change can take place it's not like he takes evil stony hearts and just click you know and turns them into righteous spiritual beings which is why we see some of what Vicky was talking about as, uh, in the process of the kingdom is that clearly there are, people have to go through the process of choosing um, the you know how they're going to live and who they're going to serve and and because if if God just magically turned you from evil into good, then what would you have learned in the process? You know, and and is that what he, then basically he's made a robot, which is not what he's ever wanted from the beginning. So it it totally makes sense that it would would be a slow and gradual process of acknowledging and recognizing the difference between good and evil and choosing consistently or trying to consistently choose the the right thing to do. Isn't right. that isn't, isn't that the whole picture of the Garden of Eden and and God's charge to Adam and Eve to expand the garden to the whole earth and dress it and keep it? Yeah, I think that's so. And I think this is, you know, um, but the point I made quite a while back was that evil was clearly present 
present in the Garden of Eden. Um, and ultimately, um, you know, in, in, when the true kingdom comes in all its fullness, um, Jesus has, uh, you know, death is destroyed. Jesus has crushed evil and and uh, of won evil over. Um, but yes, at that point, then the people who are who are with him in his kingdom have to have gone through that process of rejecting evil themselves and choosing choosing righteousness. Um, so that's enough. So to sum up, uh, the, the your question, uh, Mark, how would you how would you like to sum your question up based on what we discussed? Well, I I would my purpose for bringing it up is because I myself I've had a view in my life that I don't think is accurate. I don't think it stands up to all the scriptures. Uh, certainly it stands up to part of the scriptures that Jesus is returning. He's going to establish his kingdom in a huge way, but it denies that that view denies or Deny is probably not the right word. It it makes it so that we who've committed ourselves to God have no responsibility. We just kind of sit around as as uh, automatons, not doing anything other than maybe pray and pay, which are not small things. I'm not, but. Saying that we're loyal to God means that we are part of his army, his people. We have things to do. And it's very serious things to do because if you're part of the kingdom now in a very, very small way, you have responsibilities and you have a hand in what's going on. So I think that the the common way of saying the kingdom of God does not take place or anything happen until Jesus returns in visible fashion as we're familiar with is a misnomer that there's much more to it and we are part of it, which I think is tremendously good news. Well, here's a more lighthearted and modern <laughs> uh, comparison. When you watch what's happening in our current political system, it it appears, and people are beginning to say it out loud, that Trump is going to win the presidency. Um, but after what we saw in 2016, his presidency was undermined by not having people who were loyal and trustworthy to do the things that he felt needed to be done. And it's interesting right now watching, like after the Bronx rally and some of the other things, watching the, the people, the variety of people who are, whose eyes are being opened to the, to the sin and the evil that is happening to them and, and the, problems that are being created by the current uh, administration and they are pledging loyalty and allegiance to um, to somebody that they are hoping can turn things around and do things differently and it, it's just interesting that you you see people who are saying that they had voted, you know, Democrat all their life, and they are they are now choosing something different because they've been victimized by what they've seen, or they're seeing more clearly the comparison 
between what is and what possibly could be. And, you know, I by no means am I, <laughs> am I making the analogy that, that Trump is any kind of Jesus Christ or Messiah. But in a physical sense, you're seeing that the that the inevitable next ruler of this country is going to need a team of people who are loyal and who believe in him if some of this ridiculous evil with the transgender stuff and the wars and the immigration and things that are so clearly wrong and people are beginning to be willing to say that is wrong, I reject that and I'm going to choose something that hopefully may make a difference. I mean, it's a small window of a physical time, time in our lives, but but um, after seeing, like I said, the disloyalty of people that that he didn't have enough loyal people, it is, it's clear that if you're going to implement a different way of life, you do need loyal people to do the, the things that need to be done. Well, that that requires a people that are beholden to the principles of the particular kingdom that they have subjected themselves to. And sadly, uh, for the most part, those that are in opposition, I'm using your allegory of Trump, want nothing to do with the principles that forged and found in the country and that a, a lot of, you know, traditional Americans, that's the way I have to uh, call it, uh, refer to us, uh, still embrace. You have close to half the population that rejects those principles, those ways, those laws, that rule of law, that form of justice. They reject it because it's all about power for them. That's what the transgender movement is all about. It's about those things that are evil and are rejected by a just society that are in a state of rebellion for the purpose of establishing ab abject power. And those people have seen that now that there's pushback, the way to deal with the problem, and this was something that was written in Dreams from My Father, which is what uh, William Ayers penned for Obama, they wrote in there that you have to import, you know, the third world in, into the West uh, that, that uh, with people who are not beholden to the principles and ideas that founded the West, uh, that had their own tribalism in order to, quote unquote, right the wrongs of, uh, you know, white colonialism. So we're in a battle, as it were, just using the allegory of this country, uh, to which kingdom is going to prevail, uh, you know, because you have one that was, that is was usurped and uh, by the deep state, and they're, that's all about power for them. The question remains is whether or not those that are subjects to what was or the kingdom or, or the America that was, the kingdom of the United States, as it were, for lack of a better term, are we willing to do what's going to be necessary, which would mean to fight for it, to do what is absolutely necessary? Now, we could use this in a spiritual allegory as Christians in this walk, in this way that we're on. What are we willing to do in order to preach the good news in order to stand up for Yahweh's righteousness and his justice. Are we willing to literally fight uh, and stand up for righteousness or are we willing to go along to get along? And I think that the, the that's a question that we should always ask ourselves as Christians and one that as a people in the United States, we're going to have to make that decision ourselves. What I do know is that in a in a state of warfare that exists between good and evil, between communism and capitalism or, uh, you know, there is no middle ground because the ones that decide to be neutral are going to get squashed in the middle. You're going to have to pick one or the other. Um, and that's a choice that we're all soon going to have to, you know, uh, you know, make as Christians. We should already have made the choice because we're subject to the laws and ways of Yahweh Elohim because we made that commitment to citizenship and baptism going with what Mark said. Anyway. That's all I got. Did I kill the conversation? I have a tendency to do that. No, we had a little silence before you before you started in also. When, when we when we do finish this, do we want to stop with this subject or Mark, do you want to start another one? 
it looks like we lost some of the people. So I'm, I suspect that they got tired of listening. <laughs> well, who did we lose? We lost uh, Rod, but he, I think he might have internet issues because he, he was off and then he was on and then he was off and he was on again on a different. Of course, day. they may have gone someplace. Uh, it is a holiday weekend, yeah. Yeah, they, we only we only lost two. Or did we have eighteen or sixteen? I don't remember. No, it doesn't matter. Yeah, you know, people have things that they have to do. So, yeah, we we've got a Monday. We've got to go find a car. Oh, so I alluded at the very beginning of of my introduction about the kingdom of God about a shocking statistic and then nobody asked me about it but that's okay we got talking about so last night or yesterday evening um we were watching uh I think it was Jesse Waters and at the end they right at the end the last segment had Pete Hegseth on it and he quoted a statistic that was kind of comparing baby boomers to, was it Jill Gen, Gen X? Gen Z. Gen Z. 25%, 26% of Gen Z believe in God. Versus, versus 65% of baby boomers. And I was shocked at only 26%. That that tells you where our nation is headed, where only 26% of, of a whole group generationally believe in God. Now, of course, we don't know where the poll was taken, how it was taken, who was, you know, all that sort of thing. If memory but, serves, weren't, weren't they quoting a Barna poll? Uh, probably. I Because that if it's a Barna poll, then it's... Oh, I don't know if it was a Barna poll or not, Michael. I didn't... I thought I, you know. thought I had read that it was a Barna poll, and if it is so, that's probably pretty accurate. Yeah. But, you know, and I was going to just make the comment that, you know, going to other places other countries in the world to do mission trips is fine. But look at the field. The field, what Jesus said, the field is white, ready for harvest. White for the harvest. Uh, in our country, in our country, the newest generation says, or the newest segment of, of generation says, only 26% of them believe that there's a God or believe in God. What better place to do a mission trip? Yeah. Well, and the point too that Pete Hegseth made was, what are we teaching our children, you know? Um, when the grandparents were believers in God and the grandchildren no longer are. I mean, we've had that question forever when you look at the story of the kings that we've gone through, you know, where the one son, you know, whoever's the king does what's right in the sight of the Lord. And then, he, and he, you know, then his, he dies, his son takes over and does what's evil in the sight of the Lord. And you kind of go, well, <laughs> What was going on in that household that a godly and righteous father did not pass on those things to his children? And we we have become a nation that is afraid that is afraid to teach the next generation what is true. And, and, and it is a, it's always a fight because evil works in such a way that the youth always, believe that they know better than the adults and they'll fight you on it you know um any of us who've ha had kids you know see have seen that 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 you know the kids will roll their eyes and whatever it is you know that they um 
they always think they know better and they don't believe that, you know, they think that you're just, what you're saying is just because you want power over them and not because you're trying to teach them life lessons of what is right and good. So it's always a battle. Um, but clearly it's one that has not been fought very hard in the last few generations. Well, with, with that with, with that in mind, uh, the, the, st the statistics that my tongue is, I, I, the statistics that Mark uh, quoted or paraphrased, Jeremiah 2, chapter 1, I, I think fits. I mean, Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 1 says, The word of Yahweh came to me, came to who? Came to Jeremiah, saying, Go and proclaim in the ears of Jerusalem, saying this, Thus says Yahweh, I remember concerning you the devotion of your youth, the love of your betrothals. You're following after me in the wilderness through a land not sown. He's talking about when they left Egypt. Uh in Deuteronomy 14, 2, it says, for you are a holy people to Yahweh, your Elohim, and Yahweh has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. Now, think what he said in verse 1. You were uh, a worshipful people, let's just say that. Well, when he gets down to verse 3, he says, thus says Yahweh of hosts, the Elohim of Israel, amend your ways and your deeds, and I will let you dwell in this place. Well, the reciprocal of that is, if you don't amend your ways and your deeds, I will not let you live in this place. And... uh the, the point is that in 300 years, Israel went from following King David, following Yahweh, uh, I'm sorry, in leaving Egypt, following Yahweh, obeying him, accepting the covenant, we'll do what you tell us to do, with a few slips as, as, they, as they went along. But now here we are 300 years later and he's kicking them out of the pool. And that should frighten us. Where are we in this country now? Yep. How many years are we? 248. About the same. Huh? About the same. 247, but you, you got to go back further than the signing of the Declaration of Independence. You probably have to go back to uh, when the pilgrims landed here. You could almost establish it there because our, the genesis of this nation began then when they got here and they believe they were led by God to establish the church in the wilderness to, you know, create a, a, a nation of Christians that can preach the gospel of the whole world. Again, in reading the diaries of the founders, they expected that in order to maintain the liberty that they fought for and the, the nation that, that, you know, they had a blood and died for, it re would require the Christian church to keep the culture on the straight and narrow. And given what Jill said and what Mark said in this poll, you could, the, the, the churches stand indicted, including our church culture. We've done nothing or very little outside of filling heads with biblical knowledge, but it has had no impact really on the culture because we've shut ourselves out from the culture. And we don't have no influence on the culture saying this is the way we walk, walk in it. So it's no surprise that you have Generation Z, you know, having such a low uh, belief in, in God. But I'll tell you what the fastest growing religion in the United States is. It's Islam. And that given the millions that are coming in here that are Muslim, uh, it, it's only a matter of time before what was is completely supplanted by what is. You brought it up, Skip. I blame you. Yeah, oh, I'm, that's fine. I'm... <laughs> That's fine. I, I think we're in exactly the same position today that that uh, that Judah was in, or that Israel was in uh, back then, as as far as 
a group of people who looked at God as a leader and now very few are. 25% of, I can't keep up with the, look, I, I can't tell you what the LGBTQRSTUVs are and I can't tell you about all these generations either. I assume you just mean the latest generation, Mark. Yes. Again, that's why these studies we've been doing in, in of Israel and Judah are so valuable. Because, you know, I've gone from a mindset of working hard to try to maintain and preserve what was as far as our, our heritage goes in this country. It's seeing where God's people went and recognizing Yahweh allowed them to go into that state, um, recognizing that Yahweh is still in complete and total control of what happens and that what we're about to suffer, the consequences of our stupidity are, are still uh, the judgment. It's still in Yahweh's hand. So I don't have to get all upset and, and uh, freaked out over what we're watching take place. I'm angry about it. I imagine Jeremiah must have been angry about it. He was a young man when he was first called. And he was told by the word what their fate was going to be if they didn't shape up. And of course, you know, you would be angry. You would be disheartened. You're doing doing what you can to wake uh, people up that are marching their way towards oblivion. And of course, you know, knowing the history that we know that we've covered already, uh, they didn't listen. Uh, but these studies where we get the details of what society was like, these were Yahweh's people. These were the people he brought out of Egypt. These are the people that that through their history should have remembered where they came from and what was established for them and what was required of them. And they rejected all of it. And they suffered the consequences for it. Uh, and I find a lot of similarities in our current state. So I find these studies you've been doing to get very valuable. You know, um, in the modern sense. Go ahead. I, I don't know about you all. Um but I've been asked numerous times, why in the world are you all studying about ancient Israel? What has that got to do with anything? And I, I'm, I'm like, man, you should have been with us the last two years. You'd understand that. Yeah, I imagine a charge we would get is you guys don't don't really study Christ. You don't study Jesus. You're You're always stuck in the Old Testament. And that was the fault of worldwide. By the way, that's what my sister always says. I'm like, you don't understand that the, the Yahweh of the Old Testament is Yeshua, the Christ, the representative of the coming kingdom of God. And there are, these lessons we're learning are ones that we're living in right now. There are physical consequences to disobedience from uh, the principles that establish this particular nation. And, you know, uh, it's disheartening, I imagine, as all the, the prophets of old trying to save their people from the stupidity and consequences that were coming. I know, it's not like a broken record. Uh, anyway. By the way, Michael, um, and, and I, he hates when I bring him up, but <clears throat> Tommy calls you the lovable zealot. Yeah, I know. He calls me the zealot. I can't. You know, I blame Rod Dart a little bit for, for me being the way I am. Yeah, Tommy, go ahead. I didn't say you're lovable. I said you're beloved. Beloved, yes, that lovable, beloved. My wife would go along with that. Well, excuse me for my misquote. <laughs> beloved, but not lovable, yes. Uh, I had a point and I forgot what I was going to say. It's it cold, I guess. I am not medicated. I'm trying to avoid having to medicate myself, but that'll just make me even more fuzzy headed. Yeah, my uh, uh, Benadryl is about to close me out of this conversation. <laughs> well, look how long we've gone, Skip. I know. This is great. You had, you had no idea. What, and what, what did we talk about? We talked about what is the kingdom of God. Yep. We talked about, uh, and I thought that was a very valuable. So I, I would say this. I think that would be a valuable title to put on it since Mark asked the question. Yeah, what is the kingdom of God? I, I agree, and I am—I—I I, I did record it, and I am going to 
publish it or whatever you are. Yep. So Mark says he has all kinds of questions. So, hey, listen, well, we're ever stuck in a, in a bind, Mark. We're just putting you on the spot. We're just going to have you get, hey, Mark, ask one of those questions again so we can get a two hour uh, interactive sermon out of it. I like it. I'm, I'm hesitant to ask any other ones right now. <laughs> <laughs> right now, yeah. But I mean, it, it's, uh, what is it, uh, 10, to, 10 to 1 Central? We've been we've been going at this for what? Uh, well, two hours uh, after prayer uh, prayer requests, after the opening prayer. That's pretty good. There's a that's a whole sermon. Yep. Based on on, on worldwide standards. Well, I'm speaking in Little Rock next weekend. I may take this one with me. There you go. So all right. So next weekend is the first. Uh, I won't be here then the following two weeks because I'm going to go see Brian. Uh, he's speaking in West Tennessee on the 8th. And then the following, uh, well, I'll be here that following Sabbath, uh, but that Sunday, oh, it's just Pentecost. I'll be going down to West Tennessee with our whole Paducah congregation. I guess we're all caravanning down there because we can't use the building that we're in on uh, that Sunday. And it's already being used by the place we rented from. So. But I won't be here on the eighth step. Yeah, and I, I won't be here next Sabbath. Michael's going to lead, and then I will not be here Pentecost. They've asked me to come down to to Little Rock. I don't know why they're asking me to come down, but they have. And so we're going to need somebody to. I'll, I'll do something on Pentecost weekend, either the Sabbath or the Pentecost. Okay. I'll be here the Sabbath if you want to take Pentecost. You mean you won't be here on Pentecost? Correct. Okay. Yeah, but I will be here. Uh, we'll leave after church. You might not like the question that I ask on that day. I like all your questions. <laughs> you know, that's the thing about this group. You don't. You, you know, you don't. You don't have to agree, but our group doesn't fight. And it's it's just marvelous, you know. So anyway, okay, are are we done? I don't have anything else. I think we I thought that was a pretty good discussion about what is the kingdom of God. I thought it was excellent. Thank you, Mark, for that question. He he's got more, so that'll be fun. Yep. Okay, uh, Jim Williams, are you awake? I know sometimes he has to go back and lay down. Apparently not, he just disappeared. Yes, I am. Oh, okay. Would you close us out? Father in heaven, thank you for the blessing of this discussion on the Sabbath, the insight that it's given to us on your kingdom. Help us to meditate on this and learn even more about your ways. We ask your blessing on the coming week and on our nation and on your chosen people, Israel. And again, thank you for the Sabbath and the rest that it brings us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, thanks. Okay, this is the fourth Sabbath. Um, and Michael will, will be in, in running it next week. And then Mark will be running it on Pentecost. You know, I tell you what, Mark, I'm glad you forced me into learning how to do this, uh, where you two can start it, you know, and I, and I can send out the uh, invitation, uh, you know, to everybody for, for Pentecost. So, well, also remember that the code's the same every week. And I just, John William, uh, John Williams, John Wilson, John Williams is the guy I listened to uh, music wise, but uh, John Wilson reminded me that the, I needed to update the website with the information for Zoom instead of go to meeting. And I did that already. So if you forget what the code is, you can just go back to your previous week's email to pull the link. It should be the same every week. 
Uh, if worst comes to worst, just go to uh, you know Bible Home Fellowship uh, at WordPress.com website, and it's it's a link there also. It's my phone number. Yes. There was one thing, one more thing I was going to say. What was it? What was it? What was it? Well, anyway, I don't remember. Um, okay, well, thanks, everybody. Uh, this this has really been a good discussion. It was a heck of a lot better than what messed up notes I would have come up with today. So, uh, Thanks may, a lot, Skip. Yeah, well, we may do this more often. I, this, this, this was great. Uh, and I think this may be a, a good way for us to, uh, I'm going to say, give me a break, but, uh, you know, if we can do this a couple of times a month, well, that'd be, it'd be wonderful. Well, if you want to facilitate that, Skip, just, uh, you know, open the floor and ask any, if anyone has any doctrinal questions they want us to discuss, you know, if they have a question or they're unsure or, you know, they're, they're going to cross reference and double check something. Uh, everybody that's in this fellowship, you know, if you have a question or a subject or like Mark brought up, uh, you know, today we talked about the, doc, the, the what is the kingdom of God? If if somebody wants to get into any other sub biblical subject, I don't see why anybody, you know, in our fellowship could ask a question that we can all get involved in an interactive study slash sermon. Yep. Okay, well, I'm going to shut her down unless somebody else has something. Goodbye, and thanks, everybody. Thanks, Mark, for uh, for your, your question, which uh, really caused a great uh, discussion.